success of the ADPs, we have since then moved on to the uh, block development programs. So aspiration blocks uh, program. So now about 500 blocks have been identified this year. In January 2023, an honorable finance minister has made an announcement in a budget speech that we will be taking them up for inclusive growth and, uh, uh, and in their in growth, SMEs would play a major role. So uh, now some of the issues with the SMEs face are timely payments through by large private firms. So, uh, honorable finance minister uh, has uh, made a, in a budget speech has made it clear that the large private firms uh, they will they will not get the tax benefit of expenses in case they have not made the payments to their uh, SME firms. Uh, similarly, Ministry of Corporate Affairs it has come out with an e form. In that e form, all the big companies if they owe to the SMEs payments which they have not made so far, they are bound to report it on a six monthly basis. And that information can be made available to anybody with a view to uh, ensuring that the realization that, uh, is taken through the facilitation councils in the districts. Then uh, there is this uh, credit guarantee trust fund. Uh, this was created in the times of COVID. In COVID times, the SMEs were severely stressed. So a lot of uh, credit facility was made available to them. It was called the Atman Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan. Atman Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan. They started in 2020. And uh, collateral pre automatic loans were provided to the SMEs. Uh, this was by virtue of a trust fund which was created by Government of India. And this year, there is a record budget allocation of 22,000 crore for the SME sector. So, Thank you so much, sir, for a very detailed presentation on the SMEs. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we now have another presentation by another panel member, Ms. Antonia Menzies, Senior Financial Sector Specialist, World Bank Group. She has kindly consented to join us online. Uh, Ma'am, may I please request, I request you to kindly uh, uh, begin with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just check that you are able to hear me? Can. You can? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank IBBI and IIM Bangalore so much for inviting me to this event. And I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person. My name is Antonia Menezes. I'm a senior financial sector specialist in the World Bank Insolvency Team. We're a group that advises governments on insolvency reform. We've worked in over 100 countries, and I specialize in advice to South Asian countries. I'm delighted to see the ongoing reforms in India, and I wish IBBI the best of success in these efforts. If we can turn to the next slide, please. Today, I'll be talking about micro and small enterprise insolvency. In particular, I'll look at what are MSEs, micro and small enterprises, because that's really where the World Bank has focused its work. Why do we care about them? How do we develop specific insolvency regimes to address their financial distress? And what are some other emerging market models? And I was very delighted to see the slides of the opening remarks because I think a lot of this has already been covered. So hopefully we can go through it quite quickly. If we could go to the first slide, please, just a few back. So the, the next slide, thanks. So. The question is, what are MSMEs? And this really is an issue that in the countries where we are working on legislation and advising governments, we see very clearly that there's no standard definition. Different criteria are used in different countries and even across different industries. So some criteria might be the number of employees, the loan size, turnover. You can see on this table on the right that in China, a small business in one industry might be less than 300 employees, but in Brazil, a small business might be 10 to 49 people. 
So the size of the enterprise is really a fundamental threshold and policy question when developing an insolvency specific regime for small businesses. And this is really something that governments need to determine at the outset based on their own socioeconomic climate. Next slide, please. And why do we care about MSMEs? Why do they need a tailored insolvency regime? So this was covered in, in the opening remarks. MSMEs are the backbone of most economies, particularly in emerging markets and developing uh, economies. They account for the vast majority of businesses, often representing more than 90% of all businesses in the country. They also account for more than 60% of employment worldwide and are really important for job creation. But what we've seen is that access to finance is a key constraint for MSME growth across countries and in all regions of the world. In some countries, especially in fragile countries, the MSME financing gap is estimated at over 40% of GDP. But even in more developed countries, such as in the Eastern European region, the MSME financing gap is still over 20% of GDP. So what this suggests is a huge unmet need across all regions. And of course, what we saw with the COVID pandemic was that these challenges became even more severe as access to credit was seriously curtailed for the smallest and riskiest enterprises. What you see on this slide is World Bank Pulse data. It's a bit old now from 2020, but what it shows is that during the pandemic, smaller and informal businesses were more severely impacted by the crisis, and not only during the crisis, but also over the course of recovery. Next slide, please. So what are some of the specific challenges for small businesses? Why can't they just use the ordinary insolvency regime? We've seen that generally they they have very few incentives to access the insolvency process. They always come to it too late when rescue is almost impossible. The, a huge problem we've seen across the globe is creditor passivity, that creditors have no incentive to engage in the process because for creditors, the cost benefit and advantages of having some relatively small sums of money and having to go through a formal court process is very low. There's just very few incentives for doing that. Often there's very limited information during the insolvency process. For instance, small businesses typically don't file audited financial statements. Um, of, as I just said, they find it difficult to access finance. Uh, there's something that I'll talk about later, a huge overlap between business and personal insolvency laws. And so there's often intermingling of assets between the entrepreneur's business assets and personal assets. And there, as was mentioned in the previous presentation, typically with MSMEs, there are often insufficient assets to fund the insolvency process. Next slide, please. The World Bank's done a lot of work in this area. Some of our reports are here. You can find them on our website. And following this period of research, we published our principles on effective insolvency and creditor debtor regimes. So these are standard setting principles. They're used when assessing countries and formal financial sector assessment programs, often with the IMF. And they're also used as guidance by countries when they're developing legislation. Next slide, please. And so we developed principles on what was best practice guidance for countries to consider when developing specific regimes for MSEs, micro and small enterprises. First of all, the processes should be convenient and expensive and easily accessible. And procedural formality should be limited. So for instance, we encourage the use of electronic voting, um, minimizing a lot of procedural formalities, minimizing and lessening evidentiary burdens, etc. There should be an easy conversion from simplified proceedings to ordinary proceedings and vice versa. What we found in some countries is that you, even though it's very appealing to have processes that suit all enterprises in certain situations, this might not be suitable. The, the case might be very complex, even though it's an MSE, or it might warrant some kind of conversion to ordinary proceedings 
um, for fraud reasons or asset tracing reasons, et cetera. We still recommend that there should be approval of reorganization plans by a majority of creditors. But in our principles, you'll see that what we also recommend is when creditors fail to cast a vote on the plan because of the creditor passivity problem I mentioned, then that should be deemed approval. We recommend that the management of the business should remain with the debtor, so a debtor in possession model, but that there should be an independent supervisor or trustee or someone to assist where warranted. And the reason for this goes back to what I said about how we found that MSEs come to the process too late. We found that if they risk displacement and losing their business because the debtor in possession model is not there, then the likelihood is they'll come to the process even later. And something that was really core to the principles that we spent a lot of time discussing with a number of countries was discharge of good faith natural person entrepreneurs. We still see stigma as a huge problem across the globe. And this is really something that I'll talk about more in a minute. And finally, institutional considerations. All of this needs to be supported by relevant institutions. And these can range from debt counseling institutions to alternative dispute counseling. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, if you could go back. Yeah, next slide. So I'm just going to run through a few country examples, um, because I was asked to address how have other countries addressed this problem. I think the point that I really want to emphasize is that we need to consider personal bankruptcy regimes. As, as you heard, the bulk of MSEs are sole proprietorships, and this should not be ignored. When you say micro businesses, particularly in common law jurisdictions, you often are meaning sole proprietorships, unincorporated partnerships, and other, other enterprises that go through the personal bankruptcy regime. The experience that I've seen is that personal bankruptcy frameworks are still very rarely used in practice. Um, and even in India, the fact that the provisions haven't been notified might be something to be considered in the future. If we could just go to the US um, example, so what we saw with chapter seven, personal bankruptcy framework in the US. Yeah, that's like, um, several studies show a connection between a country's personal insolvency law and entrepreneurship. So a survey of over 20,000 families in the US showed that more entrepreneurs were around in states that had higher asset exemptions. Similarly, another study in the US compared bankruptcy exemptions and found that the probability of starting a business was 25% higher in states with higher exemptions. So there has been increasingly a body of work showing that more forgiving personal bankruptcy regimes have a direct correlation with entrepreneurship levels. The other model, if you could just go back two slides maybe, the other model that has been discussed a lot um, has been the US Small Business Reorganization Act 2019, which introduced a new sub chapter five of chapter 11. So you can see it here, exactly, this is the right slide. Um, so this, this applies to small business debtors. Under the act, it's for debtors who have a ceiling below $2,725,625. But in fact, during the pandemic, this threshold was raised to 7.5 million. So debtors who are eligible have to have debts below the ceiling of 7.5 million, although that was um, a pandemic exception under the CARES Act. The estimate is that 40% of chapter 11 debtors will qualify for the SBRA. And the objective is to streamline the process by which small business debtors reorganize and rehabilitate their financial affairs. Generally, it applies for debtor in possession. Um, the debtor remains in possession of its business with trustee assistance for certain oversight and monitoring activities, like conducting an assessment of financial viability. The court can confirm a plan even if all classes reject it. And if the court confirms a consensual plan, a sub five debtor can receive a discharge. Next slide, please. 
Singapore introduced a simplified insolvency program under the Insolvency Restructuring and Dissolution Amendment Act 2020, and it provides simpler, faster, and lower cost proceedings for MSMEs, both in restructuring and winding up. So some of the key features are restructuring or liquidation process is completed within 90 days. The simplified debt restructuring program has companies eligible if they have 30 or fewer employees, 50 or fewer creditors, and a maximum liability of $2 million, and a maximum annual sales turnover of $10 million. Once the company is accepted into the simplified debt restructuring program, the official receiver appoints a restructuring advisor to help formulate a compromise. And it also provides for simplified winding up, which generally just simplifies requirements. So for instance, there's no need for a creditors meeting and the official receiver is automatically appointed as liquidator. What I think is interesting to consider and a lot of countries are looking at this issue right now is remuneration of insolvency practitioners is partially subsidized by the government. And there is a lot of discussion right now about how do you fund these no income, no asset cases in particular. And finally, Australia, in 2021, Australia introduced a small business restructuring law to facilitate a faster and cost effective restructuring and liquidation process. And so some of the key features are that it has as well a debtor and possession model, allowing companies to retain control. Um, the eligibility requirements are that the debtor cannot exceed 1 million Australian dollars of total liabilities, and that the small businesses work with a restructuring practitioner to develop and propose a plan to creditors that will bind the company, its offices, and certain creditors if accepted. Next slide, please. So just as a concluding comment, I would reiterate that first of all, the jury frankly is still out about how successful these regimes have been. Although anecdotal evidence in the US is that the SBRA has been very highly effective and the judges I've talked to speak very highly of it. But we still haven't seen the kind of empirical research that lets us say, that yes, these MSME frameworks have a high impact on saving small businesses. What I do think needs to be considered by jurisdictions generally going forward is the role of personal bankruptcy regimes, particularly in common law countries. And in that context, we would urge countries to consider reducing stigma by focusing on discharge and maybe exempt assets and other features in the personal bankruptcy law that can really help mitigate entrepreneur risk. Um, such as alternatives to bankruptcy. Thank you so much. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions and I wish you a very good conference. Thank you so much, much ma'am for a very insightful and uh, comprehensive presentation and thank you for uh, joining us online. Thank you ma'am. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before the panel discussion, we have another presentation by one of the panel members. Uh, may I please request uh, Mr. Hiroshi Kasua, partner Baker and McKenzie Japan, to kindly present. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank IIMB and IBBI. Uh, for uh, giving, giving me uh, this great opportunity uh, to uh, present uh, Japanese um, restructuring and insolvency law uh, for SME. Uh, this is my first visit to India, uh, and it's an honor to be here and um, <laughs> make a, uh, I'm very uh, delighted and excited uh, to make this presentation. Okay. As a brief in introduction of myself, 
Uh, my name is Hiroshi Kasuya and a partner of Bacon McKenzie Tokyo office. I'm uh, focusing uh, on uh, cross-border uh, restructuring and insolvency matters. Uh, okay. Uh, here's it, uh, today's agenda. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit, talk about the uh, background uh, of SME in, in Japan. And then uh, I will talk about an uh, overview of uh, restructuring and, and insolvency laws uh, in Japan and out of court workouts uh, for SMEs in Japan. And then uh, I will present some case studies. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, I will a little bit touch upon uh, a majority board workouts uh, to be introduced uh, in Japan. Okay. Um, first, I would like to talk about the environments surrounding SMEs in Japan. Um, in Japan, uh, um, the SMEs represent 99% of total number of companies and employ uh, about 68% uh, 60, 60, uh, of total number of employees. So, uh, you know, as in the other countries, uh, in Japan, uh, the SMEs uh, played a very significant role uh, in uh, Japan's economy. And currently, um, SMEs are facing, uh, many SMEs are facing uh, financial difficulties uh, due to the ex excessive debts uh, incurred uh, in uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And, uh, the repayments of the loans uh, started uh, from last year. And also um, due to the uh, economic uh, conditions, uh, such as uh, rising costs and, and weak uh, Japanese yen. Okay. Um, in order to do such issues, um, as a measures for vitalization uh, of SMEs, uh, Japanese government uh, published um, SMEs vitalization package on March 4th uh, last year. Uh, this policy uh, consists of um, uh, first uh, continuous ass assistance of liquidity uh, for SMEs and also um, provides a comprehensive assistance of uh, improvement of profitability uh, restructuring and restart uh, of SMEs. And in line with this, um, the SME revitalization support councils, uh, which is a public organization uh, to support uh, restructuring of SMEs, is uh, reorganized and uh, transformed uh, into the new um, SME vitalization council uh, last year. And also, uh, SME restructuring guidelines are introduced last year. Um, I will touch upon uh, these two um, uh, items uh, uh, later uh, in this presentation. Okay, and next, uh, I would like to um, talk about the overview of uh, restructuring and insolvency laws in Japan. Uh, there are two categories. Uh, one is the legal proceeding. Uh, uh, we have uh, four uh, legal, legal insolvency proceedings, um, uh, civil rehabilitation and corporate reorganization, uh, which is a, a restructuring type uh, insolvency proceeding. And we have also bankruptcy and special liquidation, which are a liquidation type uh, legal proceeding. On the other hand, we have uh, out of court workouts uh, system, uh, which is very uh, frequently used uh, for SMEs. Um, you know, basically, out of court workouts is um, conducted solely based on the agreement between the parties. Uh, however, uh, we have uh, a certain rules uh, gov to govern uh, out of court workouts. Uh, this is a rule based out of court workouts. Um, uh, there are two. Uh, uh, there are some um, uh, uh, rule-based out-of-court workers in Japan, uh, but uh, I, I would like to focus on uh, this SME vitalization council scheme and SME restructuring guidelines. 
Okay. Um, first, um, I would like to overview uh, legal proceeding, insolvency proceeding uh, in Japan. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are four um, legal insolvency proceeding, a civil rehabilitation, a corporate reorganization, a bankruptcy, and special liquidation. Um, as I mentioned, uh, civil rehabilitation and corporate reorganization is a restructuring type uh, proceeding, and bankruptcy and special liquidation uh, are, are restructuring, uh, uh, sorry, um, liquidation type uh, uh, proceeding. Um, in uh, civil rehabilitation proceeding, uh, the debtor's uh, existing management uh, continues to operate the business um, during the restructuring. Uh, and uh, the data uh, prepares a rehabilitation plan, uh, which, would, which needs to be uh, approved by a creditors meeting and confirmed by the court. On the other hand, uh, in bankruptcy, um, oh, corporate reorganization proceeding is uh, mostly used for large corporation and not, not, not uh, SMEs. And the bankruptcy uh, proceeding is a, a court supervised proceeding uh, and uh, bankruptcy trustee is appointed uh, and the trustees administer the case uh, and uh, liquidate uh, the assets and liabilities of the data uh, and uh, distribute the remaining assets to creditors. And the special liquidation process uh, is, uh, uh, you know, a liquid, uh, liquidation process uh, specifically uh, designed uh, to uh, restructure, uh, 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 no, um, to, to liquidate uh, uh, insolvent companies. So the liquidator basically uh, liquidate the data uh, person to a repayment plan, uh, which will be a, 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 a approved by the creditors and confirmed by the court. Okay, uh, this is a brief comparison <clears throat> of uh, bankruptcy and civil rehabilitation proceedings. And as I mentioned, <clears throat> in bankruptcy proceeding, uh, the bankruptcy trustee uh, will administer the case and uh, liquidate the, the uh, assets and liabilities of the debtors and, and distribute uh, the remaining assets to the creators. On the other hand, uh, in civil rehabilitation process, uh, <clears throat> The data uh, continues the business uh, even during the process uh, and uh, prepare a rehabilitation plan, uh, which needs to be e e approved uh, by creators meeting and confirmed by the court. Okay. Um, next, I, I'd like to talk about out of court workouts for SMEs in Japan. Uh, there are two uh, key features uh, of SME's restructuring in Japan. One is out-of-court workouts, and another is guidelines. And as for out-of-court workouts, um, out-of-court workouts is most uh, used uh, for SME in practice. Uh, in other words, uh, in Japan, uh, when uh, restructure, uh, when uh, we restructure uh, the uh, SMEs, the first choice is out of court workouts, not the legal insolvency proceeding. Uh, why? Because our workouts uh, involve uh, financial institution creators only, not uh, involving uh, trade creators, uh, tax creators, and employees. And this process is uh, totally confidential. Uh, it is not disclosed to the public. And so, the out of court workouts process can maintain a value of the business uh, without credit insecurity. This is why uh, the out of court workouts is used for SMEs. On the other hand, um, we have another feature, uh, which is uh, the guidelines. You know, as I uh, mentioned, uh, using um, rule based out of court workout is very common in Japan. And workouts are increasingly governed by uh, guidelines. So I, I will touch upon uh, the SME restructuring guidelines uh, later in this uh, presentation. Okay, uh, next uh, I'd like to talk about um, methods of restructuring in workouts uh, in Japan. Uh, if you know the financial condition of data is not so severe, 
uh, rescheduling of payments uh, might be necessary, uh, might be uh, sufficient. Uh, however, uh, if the financial condition of the debtors is very severe, uh, we need to uh, uh, take a more drastic uh, restructuring method, uh, such as a conversion of debt uh, to equity and conversion of debt to subordinate debt. And debt forgiveness is also available uh, in, in certain situations, uh, which um, directly improve, improves the financial condition of the debtors. And also, uh, this is a unique, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, that scheme uh, in uh, restructuring in, in, in Japan. Uh, there is a so-called second company scheme. Uh, in this scheme, uh, data transfer the business uh, to another company, uh, and uh, that data is liquidated under the uh, liquidation process. Uh, this second company scheme is uh, frequently uh, used uh, in SME restructuring. Okay. Um, this table shows a uh, comparison of rule-based out-of-court workouts process, uh, which is uh, Council's uh, scheme and uh, guidelines. As you can see, uh, these two uh, process, processes are very um, similar. Uh, however, uh, the SME Council scheme uh, is uh, uh, started uh, since uh, 2008, and so uh, it has uh, uh, about uh, 15 years uh, history. On the other hand, SME guidelines has uh, just, uh, you know, uh, introduced uh, in in last year. <clears throat> and uh, we can see uh, some differences uh, between uh, two two process processes. Um, uh, first of all, uh, um, deadline uh, for resolving insolvency is uh, basically uh, five years. You know. So, in other words, uh, uh, in under this scheme, uh, that the data needs to uh, uh, resolve the insolvency uh, uh, within uh, five years. And also, uh, it should be noted that a certain subsidy uh, is available uh, for all these uh, uh, schemes. And standard timeline uh, is uh, five to nine months. Uh, for uh, council scheme and uh, six to uh, three to six months uh, for uh, SME guidelines. Okay, uh, I I'd like to uh, get into the details uh, of the SME council scheme. Uh, as I mentioned, SME Vitalization Council is a public organization. Uh, to support uh, business improvement and business revitalization for SMEs. And uh, interesting things is that um, SME, SME councils has offices uh, in each of all uh, 47 prefectures in Japan and have consultation desks for SMEs. And also, as I mentioned, uh, this uh, council's uh, scheme uh, is most used restructuring scheme for SMEs. Okay, uh, this chart uh, shows the uh, process uh, of council's scheme. First, a data uh, contacts a council uh, established in each prefecture, and the council uh, will support uh, for restructuring plan, for formulating a restructuring plan. And then uh, the data will send a request for standard steel uh, to create financial creators, and then uh, prepare uh, the restructuring plan. The councils examine the plan and review the plan, and state some opinion. Uh, uh, to, 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 to such plan. And if the restructuring plan is approved by all financial creditors, the plan will be approved and, and implemented. Okay. I would like to explain another um, out of court workout system, uh, SME restructuring guidelines. 
this is a, a, a you know you, you can see the the right hand of this slide uh you can uh, see the the structure uh, of this scheme as i mentioned uh sme structure and guidelines is established in march uh last year uh, by representative of financial and other industries uh, together with impartial uh, professionals and academics so these guidelines are not uh, established by the government uh, this is established by the basically the, the uh, you know representative of uh, various industries and professionals uh, there's no legal binding effect but uh, supported by uh, smes and uh, financial institutions okay um the key features uh of this guidelines is that the third party supporting professionals is appointed by the data and they review uh, the restructuring plan from a uh, you know fair and and equitable uh, perspective. By doing so, um, the restructuring plan uh, should be uh, fair and appropriate and uh, approved, approved uh, by the creators. Okay, uh, this is a process uh, for uh, guidelines. First, as I mentioned, a data appoints a third party supporting professionals. And then uh, data send the request for a standard steer to creators and formulate a restructuring plan. And the third party professionals review the plan and express an, their opinion to the creators. And if all creators agree to the plan, the plan will be approved and implemented. Okay. I will exp um, explain uh, some case studies uh, uh, in, in Japan. Uh, this is a, a so-called second company scheme, uh, which is uh, frequently used uh, in restructuring for SMEs in Japan. Uh, company A, old corporation, uh, transfers the good business uh, to new corporation, uh, which is called a second corporation. Uh, funded by investor and then the company a or the corporation repayments uh, uh repaid uh, the uh, debts to creators and then it will be uh, liquidated uh, by a special liquidation process and released uh, from remaining debts okay and next case study uh, relates to the, the SME guidelines. Uh, this is an uh, actual case uh, in Japan, recently uh, occurred uh, in Japan, uh, published uh, by uh, some articles uh, in Japan. Uh, in this uh, case, uh, investors uh, acquired uh, the real estate, the, the collateral, uh, from and uh, uh, shares uh, from shareholders and also uh, investor acquired uh, loan claims from banks and then uh, investor paid uh, banks the price of loan and price of collateral and as you can see uh, in the timetable uh, in right hand of this uh, slide um, it uh, took uh, only uh, several months uh, to complete uh, the restructuring uh, of the data. It's very quick and very cost effective. Okay, finally, uh, I would like to touch up on uh, majority vote uh, out of court workouts uh, in Japan. Uh, as I discussed, uh, currently, uh, out, out of court workouts. Uh, in Japan requires unanimous consent of all financial creators. So uh, it is often difficult uh, to obtain uh, agree and consent 
from all uh, financial creditors. It, it is a difficulty uh, of um, the, the Japanese SMEs are facing uh, in uh, their restructuring. However, uh, last year, uh, the Japanese government announced that uh, it is considering uh, introducing a new uh, out of court workout rules. Under the new rules, the structural plan will be binding if a majority vote of creditors is obtained and the plan is confirmed by the court. And this, is, this new um, majority vote workout system is um, discussing, uh, discussed uh, uh, currently, uh, and uh, Japanese government is planning to submit a, a bill uh, for the new registration uh, in this year. If this is a new system is introduced, the out of court workout will, will be uh, very easily uh, conducted. Uh, and it's, it's gonna be a very helpful uh, to uh, SME restructuring in Japan. Okay, this brings uh, me to uh, the end of my presentation and thank you for uh, uh, um, listening to my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for this uh, comprehensive presentation and uh, sharing insights from a different jurisdiction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed for the panel discussion. And uh, may I please invite uh, Mr. Avinash Srivastava, Honorable Member NCLT, to come to the dais. May I also invite the other eminent panel members. Uh, Mr. B. Sriram, former MD and CEO, IDBI Bank Limited. Mr. Hiroshi Kasua, partner Baker in McKinsey, Japan. Mr. V. Satya Venkata Rao, Deputy Managing Director, SIDBI. So Mr. Srivastava will be chairing the session and Mr. V. Satya Venkata Rao will be moderating the session. Over to you, sir. Good morning to the distinguished co-panelists and good morning to all the participants. First of all, I would like to congratulate IIM Bangalore and IBBI for organizing a conference which is having huge relevance at this point of time when the country is progressing and recovering from the COVID effects. In fact, the entire discussions and the presentations which we have seen for the last one hour shows the tone and tenor of this conference in trying to understand what should be the best way to move forward when it comes to the prepackaged insolvency or the insolvency resolution process for the MSMEs in the country. The importance of MSMEs and their contribution to the economy need not be overemphasized and highlighted as it is well documented and it is well established. But what is important is to find a way to support them in times of distress. In fact, if you look back for the last 20 to 30 years, we have been having numerous kind of deliberations with regard to the corporate debt restructurings and other kind of legislative framework which we had. For the benefit of all the participants, I would like to recall the Sikh Industries Companies Act and thereafter the Debt Recoveries Act, the Securitization Act, and now the Insolvency Bankruptcy Code. What are all these? Are these problems of recovery or are these the problems of the corporates to pay their debts in time and to revive their business in time? to discuss these issues and to importantly lay down what should be the framework for the future is what these distinguished panelists will be trying to attempt. In fact, this conference is more about learning from other jurisdictions because we have already built one prepackaged insolvency resolution process and the presentation by Srivastavaji has shown that the traction is still to 
gain as far as this is concerned. There could be varying reasons for this slow progress. We will try to analyze these in the coming half an hour and try to see how best we can come to some definitive conclusions as to which is the best way forward to make this insolvency resolution for MSMEs to grow in the real spirit in with which the policymakers, lawmakers, practitioners, etc., are trying to move forward. With this, I would request Sri Srivastava ji to really highlight why the MSME insolvency resolution process is not gaining traction. Are there any other specific steps which we need to take in the present context or are there reasons by which the MSMEs themselves have inhibitions in trying to use this particular platform? Just hand over to Srivastava ji. As I mentioned in my presentation, two major reasons which we have uh, discovered why pre-packs have not taken up in a big manner here are as follows. Number one, uh, there is uh, a more to be done in the field of advocacy of pre-packs and uh, extension efforts are needed both by the creditors, the government banks, as well as by the government authorities, be it the MSME ministry, be it the um, I would say IBBI and uh, oblique MCA. So uh, more of uh, advocacy would is perhaps needed in this direction to bring forth the uh, the concept of uh, pre packs before the uh, before the uh, the car, the companies the MSME companies the seven uh, the uh, seven hundred and eighty thousand companies which are about uh, sixty percent of all the active companies in the country. Because there's hardly six of them who have come forward with pre packs. Uh, the second thing, as I had said, was that uh, those uh, MSME companies which move, which uh, do prepare some pre packs uh, and approach the banks, the creators for support, we are uh, aware that this kind of support uh, from the creators is not uh, forthcoming to the extent to which the policymakers would have uh, desired would have uh, desired. So there would be an, uh, a need to impress upon the creators also that uh, they should uh, you know, move out to uh, handhold the MSMEs to come up with their uh, plans, their pre-packs, and to uh, present them before the uh, NCLT so that the same are approved and, they are, and the uh, MSME companies are, the sick MSME companies are turned around. Now, um, I'm sure that uh, you all know about pre-packs, but I thought let me just uh, briefly uh, put the thing in its uh, proper perspective. The IBC regime, it envisages a crater in uh, position or, or a crater in control regime. It's a, it's a complete, uh, uh, you know, uh, change from the earlier regime of uh, debtor in control, which was being done under the Sikh Industrial Companies Act, under the insolvency proceedings, under the company law and all that. So with the debtor in control, with, with the creator in control, we have found that uh, the promoters, the management of the companies, they are really now about to pay back their loans and to ensure that the companies run solvently and efficiently. Because this fear of the companies, you know, uh, slipping away from their hands was not there before. This IBC has had a salutary effect in that direction. And now uh, people are, uh, the, the corporates are generally paying back their loans and ensuring that their operations run successfully and solvently. So that is one major step which IBC has, uh, has achieved. Uh, we are, I'm not only talking about the cases which come before us. I'm also talking about the salutary effect of the cases which we have approved and the, the cases which therefore have stopped coming before us. Maybe some study uh, can be done by some, of the, uh, by some of the research organizations on this aspect. Those which have stopped coming, uh, uh, which have stopped uh, running into insolvency because of the salutary effect of IBC and the National Company Law Tribunal. Um, the other one, the pre-pack. Now, what the pre-pack is is slightly different from the creditor in control model. It is the debtor in control model, as somebody said, DIP, debtor in position uh, model. So the debtor continues to remain in uh, control of the company, but. Uh, it, there is a, a court appointed uh, uh, court appointed uh, trustee the, as they call in the other regimes in india we call it uh, resolution professionals 
So along with the resolution professional, a plan is prepared, a resolution plan is prepared, and uh, the debtor uh, prepares that plan that is then approved by the creditors, and then they bid it out. There is a Swiss challenge mechanism, so anybody else can come forward and put up a better plan, so the debtor is also on his toes to prepare a good plan, which will stand uh, and which uh, will meet the creditor's approval, and the creditor also get a good deal out of it. However, it has not uh, really picked up in the manner in which we have wanted it to. And I believe these are the twin reasons, the extension efforts needed by the government machinery, as well as the kind of support which the debtors, with the creators should, uh, should come forward with. Thank you. Thank you for uh, really elucidating the reasons why the traction is not at there. Now, I would like to move to the regulatory perspective. In fact, the regulators have been very active when it has come to the introduction of the insolvency code. And we have seen so many regulations being framed within no time, according to the situations that have developed. And they have paved the way for a nearly successful implementation of the corporate insolvency resolution process for the large corporates. Keeping this background in mind, I would like to request Sri Ramji to really specify as to what further that the regulators can look at in making this pre-packaged insolvency a much more successful than what it is today. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rao, and uh, thank you to all of you uh, and to all the guys and me here. Um, more than talking as a regulator, I'd rather talk as a practitioner because I've done almost 40 years in this line of uh, starting from my joining the banking industry in 1981 as SBI and then uh, at the end of it, uh, you know, now as a part-time member of like the uh, It will come up, let me tell you, in terms of funding to MSME, well, in those days we used to call it SSI and SBF sectors, that if people are still remembering that, and subsequently it was changed to this. We have come from a way where uh, uh, we were, uh, as field officers, relationship managers to uh, uh, what we call MSMEs, and almost on every Friday, I remember my days as field officer, almost on every Friday, because Saturday used to be the weekly wages uh, for MSMEs. Uh, there used to be a huge crowd of people wanting to draw access and pay the salaries. And that is how challenging it was in those days as well. Uh, from there, we have gone a long way to now uh, completely disassociate ourselves from MSME in terms of uh, you know interaction with them on a daily basis going into digital technology and so on and so forth, which does the, uh, not only the underwriting appraisal, but also does the other uh, works that are required for that. Uh, before a few, I have a few uh, suggestions, but before that, just two, three comments on my speakers, who, on the speakers who went earlier. I, I really uh, appreciate what Honorable um, uh, Shivastavji said in terms of uh, misusing the process or uh, the definition to try and get gains. I think that is something that we have to have as a challenge. We have done it, uh, you know, the government has an issue with that. The creditors, the financial creditors do have a big issue with that. And in that sense, even out of six uh, cases that have come up, if one has misused it, it becomes a bit, bit challenging in terms of promoting a certain way forward uh, in the context of the misuse. So I think that is one big area that we need to work on. And I suppose uh, that will create that uh, comfort and benefit for uh, stakeholders to, to approach this in a, in a very, because one misuse actually proves one by a significant one. Yeah, two misuses, I can say. Uh, the second thing which uh, Santana had said, you know, in terms of reducing stigma. Now the problem is in stigma, there are two things. One is the law can say and do only this much. But it's a society that creates the stigma in many ways. So again, there is a, there is a, there is a connotation or a, there is a relationship between law and uh, society in trying to accept that genuine business losses happen because of certain circumstances. And everything cannot be part of uh, a default situation in many ways. We have seen this stigma in a very big way in a large corporate scenario in, this, in the CIRP process uh, going through. Uh, it has gone significantly away forward in many ways, but we have to attach much more importance to MSME because these are people who are entrepreneurs of the finest order. 
that you know started with 5000 rupees 10000 rupees 15000 rupees and built their uh, small businesses in many ways so we need to have the laws to protect we need to have the society to acknowledge and recognize that stigma is uh, is, is something that is uh, that is you know, at the bottom of it all and uh, what uh, Mr. Hanty had said, you know, a couple of things. That, uh, one of the biggest challenges as creditors that we have in terms of, I think, uh, uh, the member also discussed that about creditors not coming up with the resolutions and so on, is the distinction between value of business and value of security. Now, the problem is uh, many times uh, uh, in MSME, it's a secured MSME, for example. If you have a resolution property as your as your collateral, the the the, uh, the distinction tends to uh, you know just disappear in many of our minds. That you know should we protect the business or should we just uh, create value out of the security and be done with it? Uh, very important, I think, as a sign of finance and interesting that we have been talking to you know to the bank level as well is the importance of sustaining a business which creates value for the security that go out anywhere. So that is one thing that we need to understand. And the second issue of MSM specifically is the continuous availability of liquidity. Now, these are the, you know, if I, if I say, this is the first sector to face stress in, in a situation of normal economic uh, you know, distress. In the value chain of personal till large corporates, the MSMEs are the first one to face distress. And that is where we get the signals whether the economy is doing well or not in terms of trying to just gauge the, the sort of uh, you know, activity in the MSME market. And therefore, you know, I think yesterday somebody was talking about imminent distress. An imminent distress point, which is uh, driven by the pre tax that has been done, is largely very important for this sector in the sense that if you really have a pulse of imminent distress rather than distress as the whole, you will find that you know things can be addressed much more easily and better. Uh, one of the things that I I, I, I do uh, advocate with banks as well is today you will find that you know we talked yesterday about artificial intelligence and uh, and the sort in terms of underwriting, in terms of sourcing, in terms of giving credit. There's a lot of underwriting which happens. But in terms of figuring out once the account has become imminent distress or in imminent distress, very easy for banks to figure out because the cash in the account tends to slowly go away in many ways. And therefore, you know that imminent distress is there in the end. Today with GST and all, we are able to find out all that. One of the suggestions that probably could be looked at by banks for prepack is to find through artificial intelligence the appropriate method or appropriate requirement of credit for the for the institution to for the MSME to survive and therefore run a resolution or run a restructuring to suit that and try and put it as, as, a, as a sort of model. So a model underwriting process for MSME in distress, I think that is something that probably will help in, in figuring out what what uh, uh, what we can do better. Uh, there are a few other um, uh, uh, or maybe I can I can come back later. You can just go ahead. I suppose. Uh, am I audible, uh, Anthony? Yeah. See, in fact, uh, when it comes to India, we are a completely different country, as diverse as it can be. And the diversity extends to its business operations also. So the models which you have shown in your presentation are worthy of emulation as far as India is concerned, provided they are suitable to our domestic conditions. One thing which I would like to know from you is, is this code-based supervision really required when there is a kind of agreement between the creditors and debtors because some of the models that we have discussed there are role based kind of settlements etc which are in place so do you suggest similar models for the indian system keeping the indian diversity and the indian business models that we have Thank you. I, I hope I, I understood the question, a very interesting question. So first of all, the, 
World Bank principles that I showed you in my presentation, these are just guidance. We completely understand that countries need to be able to adapt models to suit their socioeconomic needs. And models that might be adopted by a lot of other countries might not be suitable for one specific country. So that, that really is um, something to bear in mind. That said, the principles that we have set out for MSE insolvency are the principles that we believe after a lot of research, both empirical um, and, and academic, is that these are the main concerns that have prevented small businesses from being either restructured or liquidated effectively. I would say that I was very interested to hear about the workout models in Japan, and this is a new area that is having a lot of traction right now in other countries. Um, so in Europe, I'm sure all of you know, with the European Directive, the Second Chance Directive on prevention, a lot of models have been put in place in Europe trying to facilitate workouts at a very early stage before the business is bankrupt. And I think that is a model that is appealing for a lot of reasons, including for the debtor. They don't feel like they're in an insolvency process. A lot of the issues around stigma have, have been mitigated with those procedures. And I think that might be something that India might find very interesting. But in terms of some of the core features, so for instance, in the IBC, where you have creditor control model versus debtor and possession model, I think those are, those are decisions that have to be made at a policy level, depending on the needs of the country and what works effectively. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, taking the discussion forward on the international perspective, we would like to be highlighted as to the efficacy of debt counseling. I'll join you. After. Yeah. Uh, I would like to uh, get the views understood on debt counseling and the financial kind of education that is required to the corporates before they really take up the insolvency in a very sacred manner. Because this is not something that we should take it as a taboo. Just like an individual realizes that there are health problems and he requires medical assistance, similar will be the situation when a corporate, big or small, faces some distress. How do we really make them educated about the debt counseling? Are there any specific programs in your country, Mr. Uh, Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, in Japan, uh, there is no um, uh, there are no uh, uh, debt counseling uh, and uh, education requirements uh, before entering into the, the formal insolvency proceeding. Uh, however, as I discussed in my presentation, uh, the SME uh, councils, uh, which is a public uh, uh, organization, uh, has. Uh, many offices uh, in uh, each uh, town uh, in, in Japan, and so uh, so basically, the, the SME councils uh, in Japan uh, is uh, you know a safe haven <laughs> of the SME. So or the SME easily consult uh, with uh, councils uh, and discuss about the restructuring uh, of SMEs. And, and so the, this, you know, system uh, will be uh, is uh, very helpful uh, for SMEs to to understand uh, the restructuring uh, uh, system uh, and uh, insolvency law. Uh, so well, I, I, I would like to, to um, uh, say that um, such kind of you know uh, uh, consultation system. Uh, uh, is um, very uh, useful uh, to uh, educate uh, SMEs uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, restructuring and insolvency law. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just uh, step in for a moment in this. <clears throat> for quite some time, is it audible? For quite some time, the issue of uh, micro small industries has been on the forefront of uh, NCLT's adjudication. And it was also flagged by the Honorable Finance Minister and the uh, government. We have had several discussions with IBBA on that issue. As we were on the program, I was also talking to 
the chairman of IBBI. There are two issues, apart from what uh, my brother Avinash has presented. From World Bank side, Antonia was able to point out there are two models of Singapore and Australia. A friend from Japan was giving some pre litigation stage process. <coughs> now, the point in which we are now debating here in this second research uh, program is this. If you look at the Indian model, as was rightly pointed out, the diversity of Indian micro small industries is oriented in different cultures, languages, states. Their attitude to finance and insolvency differs from state to state in India. While the concept of uh, financing and repayment and debt and default in Gujarat, Ahmedabad, Punjab, and other Delhi will be totally different from Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, or even Kerala. This is different again in Hyderabad, in Andhra Pradesh. The mindset of people differs. So we have to tailor make programs for SMS, uh, micro small industries. This is what I was thinking about an outreach program. So as to enable these people to come out if they are not able to find a reconciliation with the financial creditors. Therefore, as I said yesterday, there may be one more stakeholder who has to come into this, and there may be the Ministry of Micro Small uh, Industries also. If you take the Japan model, as my friend was saying, there is a procedure which comes before they come to litigation, and that could also be solved. So we need those government to participate in a process where MSMEs are brought into a particular table with the guidance of federation of industries or micro industries, small industries federation. And a code can be created there so that they can work out their method of resolution before coming to an adjudicatory process, which is the second stage. I think, as Antonia was mentioning, the, the Japanese model could be examined in concerns with Indian types. And that is where the research of people from IAM becomes very relevant. You have to take that and give us some positive uh, solutions to that. The second one was, uh, Antonio was referring to the Singapore model and Australian model, which I also feel it is correct. If the first stage of resolution does not happen with the uh, council, what the Japanese method called council, which we can have a different name, nomenclature, is that it comes to an adjudicative process. For that, my thought process is simplification. Yesterday, Professor Vikram, am I correct? Vikram, Vikrant was talking about simplification of process. If a particular SM, SME wants to uh, initiate a process through an alternative mechanism like a council or a, a forum and doesn't uh, get the uh, proper response from the financial creditors, which may be uh, single or multiple, then he can make an application to the, uh, the tribunal to initiate a process. But that process should not be cumbersome. It should be, this is where I say artificial intelligence comes. That one pager or two pager application will be just received and all the stakeholders will be brought to a table and they should be asked to come with a resolution plan. It should be so simplified that it does not take a laborious, long drawn process of adjudication. This is where we need that artificial intelligence, and that is why we need a researchers like you. The third one is SMEs are, uh, as, uh, as were defined, in countries like uh, South America, in India, in, uh, in Africa, are small 
enterprises by mostly by uh, individual entrepreneurs or for women and there may be one or maybe at maximum two uh, financial creditors so it doesn't need a large number of people to be brought around the only thing is we have to create a platform for them to come with a solution thirdly in SMEs, the question of financial creditors getting control is absolutely, I don't think it will work because nobody wants to take it for, as you said, economic reasons. But also, it is driven by the knowledge and the capacity of that uh, promoter. It's a lady. For example, you are creating a Bandini silk sari enterprise and you fail to COVID. Who will, which financial creditor is going to take that? Only you can do it. You can turn around and come back. But what method or incentive will give to them is for the regulators, the government to think and come with a solution, whether the debt will be formed as an equity or it will be shown in a, a takeover. The other model which was uh, taken from Japan is that uh, the second sale of the company. We are also having something like that. It's called a plan, which is given by a third party and it is uh, executed. So these are all various uh, methods, but it should be tailor-made, particularly for India. There are varieties and innumerable permutation combinations of SMEs. It's just not one. There is no one-fit solution for SME problems. So there has to be a collective and proper research done to find out what are all the categories. Like my brother Avinash was saying, 63 million, right? Yes, so that has to be subdivided by the MSME industry because that department should uh, collate and uh, give. See, for example, people who may be doing in you know uh, parts, uh, uh, small parts supplying to a bigger company. There may be something to do with uh, uh, soap manufacturing and marketing through big corporates like ITC because your natural products now come, people make it at home and they sell you through the platform of multinationals or, uh, or big companies. So each one needs a different set of uh, factory. So keeping that in mind, maybe the best practices which are suggested in uh, Europe, in Singapore, in Australia, in Japan, or even South America. So we should come out with some solution which will be tailor-made for India. We can't give solutions to others, but we have a big uh, problem in SMEs. The more important thing is people like Mr. Sriram, who know the uh, route uh, at the ground level, they should be the persons who should be giving ideas how to give that outreach to these people because they are not coming forward. So they are coy, reserved. So we have to project ourselves and bring them into the fold. And this is where we need to be. Uh, get get the best minds. Thank you. Thank you for those wonderful insights, sir. In fact, uh, the entire conference, I believe, will deliberate on these kind of things and come with different conclusions as to what could be the best practices that the Indian system can adapt. In fact, this session, what we had is only the initial round. I'm sure that the successive sessions will lead to further more depths of understanding and we will definitely be benefited by this three-day conference. I individually thank each of these participants and panelists today for enlightening the participants with their deep and incisive kind of thoughts which I believe will be taken forward in the next sessions. I thank the individually each one of you. Due to paucity of time, we could not deliberate more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you all the panel members for this uh, insightful panel discussion. And uh, thank you, Sudhakar, sir, for your sharing your insights. Uh, thank you, Ms. Antonia, for joining this online. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now proceed for the memento ceremony. Uh, may I please request Professor Jaydev to kindly present a memento to Honorable uh, Member Mr. Avinash Shrivastava. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I please request Mr. Sandhush Shukla, Executive Director IBBI, to present a memento to Mr. B. Shriram. Former MD and CEO, IDBI Bank. 
May I please request Mr. Amit Pradhan, Executive Director, IDBI, to present a memento to Mr. Hiroshi Kasua, partner Baker and McKenzie, Japan. May I please request Mr. Sandeep Garg, Executive Director, IBBI, to present a memento to Mr. V. Satya Venkata Rao, Deputy Managing Director, SIDBI. And thank you so much, Ms. Antonia Menzies, for joining us online. Thank you so much, ma'am.